Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. It is so great to be back home at All Saints, my my West Coast home. I am delighted to be here with you this morning. And uh, I need to report that uh, in in preparation for my visit here, uh, I had a revelation from God last night in the middle of the night. I was reading on your website where you were having this this great array of of lay ministries outside, and and I've actually been here before on on this time when you when you do that, and uh, I always say that that coming to All Saints is a little like coming to a circus, <laughs> and you've got all these lay ministries and everything. So here is my revelation from God. You ought to call this. Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> yeah? I mean, you are so lay. <laughs> I also uh, had a revelation from God that probably the reason I was asked to preach here today is that your rector didn't want to preach on this gospel. I was a little surprised, given the feistiness of this congregation, that someone, as, as Zelda was reading the story, didn't yell out, is that really in there? <laughs> what an awful, awful gospel reading. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I don't often read a lot of commentaries on a gospel. I read every commentary I could find, and they all came up with the same answer. We, we actually don't know why Jesus said this. <laughs> but, you know, as Anglicans, uh, we put Scripture in its context, and we're going to need every bit of contextual work we can summon up this morning to understand what in the world this gospel might have to say to you and me. Now, a little review... Bible 101. Remember that Mark is the earliest gospel. It's sort of the uh, Cliff's Notes version of Jesus' life, very pared down and spare. And then uh, about 10 years later, Mark and Luke, um, excuse me, Matthew and Luke write their gospels, and they have a copy of Mark uh, in front of them along with some other materials. And remember that Matthew is writing for Jews, so He emphasizes things that are important to Jews. But Luke, whose gospel we read this morning, Luke is an outsider. Uh, He's a Gentile. He knows what it's like to be on the outside. And his gospel is uh, uh, written by an outsider for outsiders. And for anyone who's ever been on the receiving end of hatred and oppression and marginalization, uh, I I think it's our favorite. And let's remember that this gospel comes just after Luke is trying to make the point that all of us are included in God's love, that no one is beyond, that God wants a relationship with you and me, bad and good, everyone God wants in the fold. And so he he tells in the chapters just before this, he tells the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and then that uh, greatest of, it's probably my favorite story in in all of scripture, uh, the prodigal son, which only occurs in Luke's gospel. Uh, Can you imagine Christianity without the prodigal son? And the point of of the prodigal son, at at least at first, seems to be that no matter how bad the son was, no matter how poorly he treated his father, taking his inheritance, going off and squandering it on wild and riotous living, the father never stops loving him. But 
sits on the front porch in a rocking chair, looking down the road, hope after hope that the sun will return. And when the sun returns, he's not interested in his apology, which the, which the prodigal has been working on ever since he left. But the father only wants to put a ring on his finger and a robe around his shoulders and throw a party. And then Luke quotes Jesus telling this really strange story. Not the kind of story you'd want to read your kids before bed. <laughs> About this awful man who had been mismanaging the master's uh, wealth, realizes he's going to be fired, so he calls in all the uh, debtors and, and uh, reduces their debt by 90%, knowing that when he does get fired, he'll have somebody to take him in because he's too lazy to work and he's too proud to beg. Not exactly great material. <laughs> but I think Luke is trying to make the point that God loves even dirty, rotten scoundrels. In fact, you can't be dirty enough, rotten enough, or scoundrelish enough to have God not love you. And, and it seems even that Jesus is sort of playing with this, saying that, you know, God loves chutzpah. God loves people with character who are, are feisty. And, and, and maybe even better than the children of light, that would be us, <laughs> right? So let's, let's talk about scoundrels for a minute. You know, there's a, a great thing that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is you go into a room you're with a bunch of strangers, and the first thing that happens is you say, my name is Gene and I'm an alcoholic. It is just this astoundingly leveling uh, dynamic. And one that I, I wish we could learn in church. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better if at the beginning of every service we just went around and everyone had a chance to say, hi, I'm Gene and I'm here because I'm a sinner. I might enjoy the music, occasionally get a decent sermon, I love, I, <laughs> but I'm here because I need to be here. I need to be here because if the truth be known, I'm a scoundrel. Now we, we sort of do this, it's called the collect for purity. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secret is hid. How frightening. <laughs> We're basically saying, look, uh, we, we just didn't get it right this week, or this month, or this year. But here we are. And God loves even me. But the fact of the matter is, most of us aren't actually scoundrels. We're better than that. And, and there is a danger in being reasonably good, which most of us are. So here's, here's the danger in being reasonably good, is that you forget that you need God. When my life is going well, it is amazing to me how quickly I can forget that I need God every minute of every day. I can even be doing so well that I think I'm the reason I'm doing so well. And I can completely forget. It's, it's surprising to me that people love the Beatitudes so much. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are, are persecuted for righteousness sake. Why do people love that so much? None of us would want to be any of those things. 
mourning or, or being persecuted or hungering and thirsting. The reason people in those situations are blessed is that when you're in one of those conditions, you remember your need of God. And sometimes we good people forget our need of God. Did you ever notice in the Gospels how the, the dirty, rotten scoundrels all come to Jesus? They gather around him like, like flies to honey because they know their need of God. And it was the good people of Jesus' time who opposed him because he was making life pretty darned uncomfortable. So I think Luke is saying this morning that if you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel, there is hope even for you because God's love is big enough, broad enough, wide enough, deep enough to take in all of us. But the, for those of us who are good, it's harder. Going back to the prodigal son, the most pathetic character in that story is the older son who stays at home, pretty much does what dad asks him, you know, goes out and toils in the fields, does everything he's told, and he doesn't realize his need of the father's love as well. We are in danger, most of us, not of being the prodigal son, but of being the older brother. Indeed. And, and we have to be careful as Christians not to be just good enough. You know, it, it's, it's like what you've probably heard me say before is that we have to decide whether we're going to be disciples or admirers only of Jesus. And can I just tell you, Jesus doesn't need any more admirers. You know, it's nice to come here on a Sunday morning and it's really great to see one another and we slap each other on the back and say how great it is and we go to coffee hour and it's just a wonderful experience. But, but then you'd never know we had been in church on the next day. Jesus doesn't need any more admirers. What Jesus wants are disciples. All too often, we, we come to church almost as if we're looking to get an inoculation. You know how an inoculation works. You don't want to get smallpox, so you, you go to the doctor and you get just enough smallpox in your arm to build up antibodies so that you never really get smallpox. Maybe some of us come to church on Sunday morning to get just enough religion so we are sure not to get a full-blown case. <laughs> so if, if when you leave here, you feel just a little bit better about being a Christian, take care that it, you haven't just gotten an inoculation. I think part of what Luke and Jesus are saying here is that God would rather see us step out there, take some chances, take some risks with the gospel, get into some gospel trouble on God's behalf. And if we screw up, that's okay, because even dirty, rotten scoundrels are loved by God. So what if we make a mistake? How about our getting a little chutzpah to do good in the world. Our danger as pretty much good people is that we will have just enough religion to keep us from getting a full-blown case. So this very strange, odd story I think is poking us to be bold in Jesus' name, to stand up, to fight, to stand up to, to $40 billion being uh, uh, taken out of food stamps over the next 10 years. 
in the richest nation on earth, the richest nation in history, and we can't feed our people. One in five kids will go to bed hungry tonight. Let's get into some gospel trouble. Let's stand up on God's behalf for God's people. So the question for you and for me every day is, am I going to be simply an admirer of Jesus or a disciple? And am I willing to get into some real trouble? Real trouble for God. I think God is wanting you to ask how you can make a difference in the world. That's what all these booths out there in this Cirque du Soleil were about this morning. How can you make a difference in your life? And do you trust that God will love you no matter how badly you fail, but will love you so much if you try? We have a God, we know a God who loves dirty, rotten scoundrels and good people alike. And the world outside these walls don't know that and they are so fearful. And they're fearful that if they come in here, they'll hear a God about a God who is all about judging them when what we know is that God loves us beyond our wildest imagining. And rather than just making us good, it ought to make us bold. We ought to get into some gospel trouble. So go out there and tell them about this God who loves dirty, rotten scandals and good people alike. And then, after you've told them you believe in that God, Live your life as if you really did. Let the church say amen.